This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. This reading by Stuart Wills. Moby Dick by Herman Melville. Chapters 17 to 21. Chapter 17. The Ramadan. As Queequeg's Ramadan, or fasting and humiliation, was to continue all day, I did not choose to disturb him till towards nightfall, for I cherished the greatest respect towards everybody's religious obligations, never mind how comical, and couldn't find it in my heart to undervalue even a congregation of ants worshipping a toadstool, or those other creatures in certain parts of our earth who, with a degree of footmanism quite unprecedented in other planets, bow down before the torso of a deceased landed proprietor merely on account of the inordinate possessions yet owned and rented in his name. I say we good Presbyterian Christians should be charitable in these things, and not fancy ourselves so vastly superior to other mortals, pagans and what not, because of their half-crazy conceits on these subjects. There was Queequeg now, certainly entertaining the most absurd notions about Yojo and his Ramadan, but what of that? Queequeg thought he knew what he was about, I suppose. He seemed to be content, and there let him rest. All our arguing with him would not avail. Let him be, I say, and heaven have mercy on us all, Presbyterians and pagans alike, for we are all somehow dreadfully cracked about the head, and sadly need mending." Towards evening, when I felt assured that all his performances and rituals must be over, I went up to his room and knocked at the door, but no answer. I tried to open it, but it was fastened inside. Queequeg, said I softly through the keyhole, all silent. I say, Queequeg, why don't you speak? It's I, Ishmael. But all remained still as before. I began to grow alarmed. I had allowed him such abundant time I thought he might have had an apoplectic fit. I looked through the keyhole, but the door opening into an odd corner of the room, the keyhole prospect was but a crooked and sinister one. I could only see part of the footboard of the bed, and a line of the wall, but nothing more. I was surprised to behold, resting against the wall, the wooden shaft of Queequeg's harpoon, which the landlady the evening previous had taken from him before our mounting to the chamber. That's strange, thought I. But at any rate, since the harpoon stands yonder, and he seldom or never goes abroad without it, therefore he must be inside here, and no possible mistake. Queequeg! Queequeg! All still. Something must have happened. Apoplexy. I tried to burst open the door, but it stubbornly resisted. Running downstairs, I quickly stated my suspicions to the first person I met, the chambermaid. "'La, la!' she cried. "'I thought something must be the matter. "'I went to make the bed after breakfast, and the door was locked, "'and not a mouse to be heard, and it's been just so silent ever since. "'But I thought maybe you had both gone off and locked your baggage in for safekeeping. "'La, la, ma'am! Mistress! Murder! Mrs. Hussey! Apoplexy!' "'And with these cries she ran toward the kitchen, I following.' Mrs. Hussey soon appeared with a mustard pot in one hand and a vinegar cruet in the other, having just broken away from the occupation of attending to the casters and scolding her little black boy meantime. Woodhouse, cried I, which way to it? Run, for God's sake, and fetch something to pry open the door. The axe, the axe, he's had a stroke, depend upon it. And so saying, I was unmethodically rushing upstairs again empty-handed when Mrs. Hussey interposed the mustard pot and vinegar cruet, and the entire caster of her countenance. "'What's the matter with you, young man?' "'Get the axe. For God's sake, run for the doctor, someone, while I pry it open.' "'Look here,' said the landlady, quickly putting down the vinegar cruet, so as to have one hand free. "'Look here. Are you talking about prying open any of my doors?' And with that she seized my arm. "'What's the matter with you? What's the matter with you, shipmate?' In as calm but as rapid a manner as possible, I gave her to understand the whole case. Unconsciously clapping the vinegar cruet to one side of her nose, she ruminated for an instant, then exclaimed, "'No, I haven't seen it since I put it there. 
Running to the little closet under the landing of the stairs, she glanced in, and returning, told me that Queequeg's harpoon was missing. "'He's killed himself!' she cried. "'It's unfortunate Stig's done over again. There goes another counterpane. God pity his poor mother. It'll be the ruin of my house. Has the poor lad a sister? Where's that girl? There, Betty!' Go to Snarls the painter and tell him to paint me a sign with no suicides permitted here and no smoking in the parlor. Might as well kill both birds at once. Kill! Ah, oh, the Lord be merciful to his ghost. What's that noise there? You, young man, have asked there. And running up after me, she caught me as I was again trying to force open the door. I don't allow it. I won't have my premises spoiled. Go for the locksmith. There's one about a mile from here. But a vast, putting her hand in her side pocket, here's a key that'll fit, I guess. Let's see. And with that she turned it in the lock, but alas, Queequeg's supplemental bolt remained undrawn within. Have to burst it open, said I, and was running down the entry a little for a good start when the landlady caught at me, again vowing that I should not break down her premises. But I tore from her, and with a sudden bodily rush dashed myself full against the mark. With a prodigious noise the door flew open, and the knob slamming against the wall sent the plaster to the ceiling. And there, good heavens, there sat Queequeg, altogether cool and self-collected, right in the middle of his room, squatting on his hams and holding Yojo on the top of his head. He looked neither one way nor the other way, but sat like a carved image with scarce a sign of active life. "'Queequeg,' said I, going up to him. "'Queequeg, what's the matter with you?' "'He hain't been sitting so all day, has he?' said the landlady. But all we said, not a word could we drag out of him. I almost felt like pushing him over so as to change his position, for it was almost intolerable. It seemed so painfully and unnaturally constrained, especially as in all probability he had been sitting so for upwards of eight or ten hours, going to without his regular meals. "'Mrs. Hussey,' said I, "'he's alive at all events, so leave us, if you please, and I will see to this strange affair myself.' Closing the door upon the landlady, I endeavoured to prevail upon Queequeg to take a chair, but in vain. There he sat, and all he could do, for all my polite arts and blandishments, he would not move a peg, nor say a single word, nor even look at me, nor notice my presence in the slightest way. I wonder, thought I, if this can possibly be a part of his Ramadan. Do they fast on their hams that way in his native island? It must be so. Yes, it's part of his creed, I suppose. Well, then, let him rest. He'll get up sooner or later, no doubt. It can't last forever, thank God, and his Ramadan only comes once a year, and I don't believe it's very punctual then. I went down to supper. After sitting a long time listening to the long stories of some sailors who had just come from a plum-pudding voyage, as they call it, uh, that is, a short whaling voyage in a schooner or brig confined to the north of the line in the Atlantic Ocean only. After listening to these plum puddingers till nearly eleven o'clock, I went upstairs to go to bed, feeling quite sure by this time Queequeg must certainly have brought his Ramadan to a termination. But no, there he was, just where I had left him. He had not stirred an inch. I began to grow vexed with him. It seemed so downright senseless and insane to be sitting there all day and half the night on his hams in a cold room, holding a piece of wood on his head. For heaven's sake, Queequeg, get up and shake yourself. Get up and have some supper. You'll starve. You'll kill yourself, Queequeg. But not a word did he reply. Despairing of him, therefore, I determined to go to bed and to sleep, and no doubt before a great while he would follow me. But previous to turning in, I took my heavy bearskin jacket and threw it over him, as it promised to be a very cold night, and he had nothing but his ordinary round jacket on. For some time, do all I would, I could not get into the faintest doze. I had blown out the candle, and the mere thought of Queequeg, not four feet off, sitting there in that uneasy position, stark alone in the cold and dark, this made me really wretched. Think of it sleeping all night in the same room with a wide-awake pagan on his hams in this dreary, unaccountable Ramadan. But somehow I dropped off at last, and knew nothing more till break of day, 
when, looking over the bedside, there squatted Queequeg, as if he had been screwed down to the floor. But as soon as the first glimpse of sun entered the window, up he got, with stiff and grating joints, but with a cheerful look, limped towards me where I lay, pressed his forehead against mine, and said his Ramadan was over. Now, as I before hinted, I have no objection to any person's religion, be it what it may, so long as that person does not kill or insult any other person, because that other person don't believe it also. But when a man's religion becomes really frantic, when it is a positive torment to him, and in fine makes this earth of ours an uncomfortable inn to lodge in, then I think it high time to take that individual aside and argue the point with him. And just so I now did with Queequeg. Queequeg, said I, get into bed now and lie and listen with me. Then I went on, beginning with the rise and progress of the primitive religions, and coming down to the various religions of the present time, during which time I laboured to show Queequeg that all these Lents, Ramadans, and prolonged ham-squattings in cold, cheerless rooms were stark nonsense, bad for the health, useless for the soul, opposed, in short, to the obvious laws of hygiene and common sense, I told him, too, that he, being in other things such an extremely sensible and sagacious savage, it pained me, very badly pained me, to see him now so deplorably foolish about this ridiculous Ramadan of his. Besides, argued I, fasting makes the body cave in, hence the spirit caves in, and all thoughts born of a fast must necessarily be half-starved, this is the reason why most dyspeptic religionists cherish such melancholy notions about their hereafters. In one word, Queequeg, said I, rather digressively, hell is an idea first born on an undigested apple dumpling, and since then perpetuated through the hereditary dyspepsias nurtured by Ramadans. I then asked Queequeg whether he himself was ever troubled with dyspepsia, expressing the idea very plainly so that he could take it in. He said no, only upon one memorable occasion. It was after a great feast given by his father, the king, on the gaining of a great battle wherein fifty of the enemy had been killed by about two o'clock in the afternoon, and all cooked and eaten that very evening. No more, Queequeg, said I, shuddering. That will do, for I knew the inferences without his further hinting them. I had seen a sailor who had visited that very island, and he told me that it was the custom, when a great battle had been gained there, to barbecue all the slain in the yard or garden of the victor, and then, one by one, they were placed in great wooden trenchers, and garnished round like a pillow, with breadfruit and coconuts, and with some parsley in their mouths, were sent round with the victor's compliments to all his friends, just as though these presents were so many Christmas turkeys. After all, I do not think that my remarks about religion made much of an impression on Queequeg, because, in the first place, he somehow seemed dull of hearing on that important subject, unless considered from his own point of view, and, in the second place, he did not more than one-third understand me, couch my ideas as simply as I would, and, finally, he no doubt thought he knew a good deal more about true religion than I did. He looked at me with a sort of condescending concern and compassion, as though he thought it a great pity that such a sensible young man should be so hopelessly lost to evangelical pagan piety. At last we rose and dressed, and Queequeg, taking a prodigiously hearty breakfast of chowders of all sorts, so that the landlady should not make much profit by reason of his Ramadan, we sallied out to board the Pequod, sauntering along and picking our teeth with halibut bones. Chapter 18 his mark. As we were walking down the end of the wharf towards the ship, Queequeg carrying his harpoon, Captain Peleg, in his gruff voice, loudly hailed us from his wigwam, saying he had not suspected my friend was a cannibal, and furthermore announcing that he let no cannibals on board that craft unless they previously produced their papers. "'What do you mean by that, Captain Peleg?' said I, now jumping on the bulwarks, and leaving my comrade standing on the wharf. "'I mean,' he replied, "'he must show his papers.' "'Yes,' said Captain Bildad, in his hollow voice, sticking his head from behind Peleg's out of the wigwam. "'He must show that he's converted. "'Son of darkness,' he added, turning to Queequeg, "'art thou at present in communion with any Christian church?' 
Why, said I, he's a member of the first congregational church. Here be it said that many tattooed savages sailing in Nantucket ships at last come to be converted into churches. First congregational church, cried Bildad. What, that worships in Deacon Deuteronomy Coleman's meeting-house? And so saying, taking out his spectacles, he rubbed them with his great yellow bandana handkerchief, and putting them on very carefully, came out of the wigwam, and leaning stiffly over the bulwarks, took a good long look at Queequeg. "'How long hath he been a member?' he then said, turning to me. "'Not very long, I rather guess, young man.' "'No,' said Peleg. And he hasn't been baptized right either, or it would have washed some of that devil's blue off his face. Do tell now, cried Bildad, is this Philistine a regular member of Deacon Deuteronomy's meeting? I never saw him going there, and I pass it every Lord's Day. I don't know anything about Deacon Deuteronomy or his meeting, said I. All I know is that Queequeg here is a born member of the First Congregational Church, he is a deacon himself, Queequeg is. Young man, said Bildad sternly, thou art skylarking with me. Explain thyself, thou young Hittite. What church dost thee mean? Answer me. Finding myself thus hard pushed, I replied, I mean, sir, the same ancient Catholic church to which you and I and Captain Peleg there and Queequeg here and all of us and every mother's son and soul of us belong the great and everlasting first congregation of this whole worshipping world. We all belong to that. Only some of us cherish some queer crotchets, in no way touching the grand belief. In that we all join hands. "'Splice, thou meanst! Splice hands!' cried Peleg, drawing nearer. "'Young man, you'd better ship for a missionary instead of a foremast hand. I never heard a better sermon.' Deacon Deuteronomy, why, Father Mapple himself couldn't beat it, and he's reckoned something. Come aboard, come aboard, never mind about the papers. I say, tell Quahog there, what's that you call him? Tell Quahog to step along. By the great anchor, what a harpoon he's got there. Looks like good stuff, that, and he handles it about right. I say, Quahog, or whatever your name is, did you ever stand in the head of a whale-boat? Did you ever strike a fish? Without saying a word, Queequeg, in his wild sort of way, jumped upon the bulwarks, from thence into the bows of one of the whale-boats hanging to the side, and then bracing his left knee and poising his harpoon, cried out in some such way as this, "'Cap'n, you see him small drop tar on water there. You see him? Well, s'pose him one whale eye. Well, den.' And taking sharp aim at it, he darted the iron right over Bildad's broad brim, clean across the ship's deck, and struck the glistening tar spot out of sight. Now, said Queequeg, quietly hauling in the line, s'pose him whaley eye, why, dat whale dead. Quick, Bildad, said Peleg, his partner, who, aghast at the close vicinity of the flying harpoon, had retreated towards the cabin gangway. Quick, I say you, Bildad, and get the ship's papers. We must have Hedgehog, the, I mean Quahog, in one of our boats. Look ye, Quahog, We'll give you the ninetieth lay, and that's more than ever was given a harpooner yet out of Nantucket. So down we went into the cabin, and to my great joy, Queequeg was soon enrolled among the same ship's company to which I myself belonged. When all preliminaries were over, and Peleg had got everything ready for signing, he turned to me and said, I guess Quahog there don't know how to write, does he? I say, Quahog, blast ye! Dost thou sign thy name, or make thy mark? But at this question Queequeg, who had twice or thrice before taken part in similar ceremonies, looked no ways abashed, but taking the offered pen, copied upon the paper, in the proper place, an exact counterpart of the queer round figure which was tattooed upon his arm, so that through Captain Peleg's obstinate mistake touching his appellative, it stood something like this. Quahog. His mark. X. Meanwhile, Captain Bildad sat earnestly and steadfastly eyeing Queequeg, and at last, rising solemnly and fumbling in the huge pockets of his broad-skirted drab coat, took out a bundle of tracts, and selecting one entitled, 
the latter day coming or no time to lose, placed it in Queequeg's hands, and grasping them and the book with both his, looked earnestly into his eyes and said, Son of darkness, I must do my duty by thee. I am part owner of this ship, and feel concerned for the souls of all its crew. If thou still clingest to thy pagan ways, which I sadly fear, I beseech thee, remain not for I a belial bondsman. Spurn the idle bell, and the hideous dragon. Turn from the wrath to come. Mind thine eye, I say. Ah, oh, goodness gracious, steer clear of the fiery pit. Something of the salt sea yet lingered in old Bildad's language, heterogeneously mixed with scriptural and domestic phrases. Avast there, avast there, Bildad, avast now spoiling our harpooner, cried Peleg. Pious harpooners never make good voyagers. It takes the shark out of them. No harpooner is worth a straw who ain't pretty sharkish. There was young Nat Swain, once the bravest boat-header out of all Nantucket and the vineyard. He joined the meeting and never came to good. He got so frightened about his plaguy soul that he shrinked and steered away from whales, for fear of afterclaps, in case he got stove and went to Davy Jones. Peleg, Peleg, said Bildad, lifting his eyes and hands, thou thyself, as I myself, hast seen many a perilous time. Thou knowest, Peleg, what it is to have the fear of death. How then canst thou prate in this ungodly guise? Thou beliest thine own heart, Peleg. Tell me, when this same Pequod here had her three masts overboard in that typhoon on Japan, that same voyage when thou went mate with Captain Ahab, didst thou not think of death and the judgment then? Hear him, hear him now, cried Peleg, marching across the cabin and thrusting his hands far down into his pockets. Hear him, all of ye. Think of that, when every moment we thought the ship would sink. Death and the judgment then? What? With all three masts making such an everlasting thundering against the side, and every sea breaking over us fore and aft? Think of death and the judgment then? No, no time to think about death then. Life was what Captain Ahab and I was thinking of, and how to save all hands, how to rig jury masts, how to get into the nearest port. That's what I was thinking of. Bildad said no more. But, buttoning up his coat, stalked on deck, where we followed him. There he stood, very quietly overlooking some sailmakers who were mending a topsail in the waist. Now and then he stooped to pick up a patch, or save an end of tarred twine, which otherwise might have been wasted. CHAPTER Nineteen, THE PROPHET Shipmates, have ye shipped in that ship? Queequeg and I had just left the Pequod, and were sauntering away from the water, for the moment each occupied with his own thoughts, when the above words were put to us by a stranger, who, pausing before us, leveled his massive forefinger at the vessel in question. He was but shabbily apparelled in faded jacket and patched trousers, a rag of a black handkerchief investing his neck. A confluent smallpox had in all directions flowed over his face, and left it like the complicated ribbed bed of a torrent when the rushing waters have been dried up. "'Have ye shipped in her?' he repeated. "'You mean the ship Pequod, I suppose,' said I, trying to gain a little more time for an uninterrupted look at him. "'Aye, the Pequod. That ship there,' he said, drawing back his whole arm, and then rapidly shoving it straight out from him with the fixed bayonet of his pointed finger darted full at the object. Yes, said I, we have just signed the articles. Anything down there about your souls? About what? Oh, perhaps you haven't got any, he said quickly. No matter, though. I know many chaps that haven't got any. Good luck to him, and they are all the better off for it. A soul's a sort of a fifth wheel to a wagon. What are you jabbering about, shipmate? said I. He's got enough, though to make up for all deficiencies of that sort and other chaps. Abruptly said the stranger, placing a nervous emphasis upon the word he. Queequeg, said I, let's go. This fellow has broken loose from somewhere. He's talking about something and somebody we don't know. Stop, 
cried the stranger. "'You said true. You haven't seen old thunder yet, have ye?' "'Who's old thunder?' said I, again riveted with the insane earnestness of his manner. "'Captain Ahab!' "'What, the captain of our ship, the Pequod?' "'Aye, among some of us old sailor chaps he goes by that name. "'You haven't seen him yet, have ye?' "'No, we haven't. He's sick, they say, but is getting better, and will be all right again before long.' "'All right again before long,' <laughs> laughed the stranger, with a solemnly derisive sort of laugh. "'Look ye, when Captain Ahab is all right, then this left arm of mine will be all right, not before.' "'What do you know about him?' "'What did they tell you about him? Say that!' "'They didn't tell much of anything about him, only I've heard he's a good whale-hunter and a good captain to his crew.' "'That's true.' "'That's true, yes, both true enough. "'But you must jump when he gives an order. "'Step and growl, growl and go. "'That's the word with Captain Ahab. "'But nothing about the thing that happened to him off Cape Horn long ago, "'when he lay like dead for three days and nights. "'Nothing about that deadly scrimmage with the Spaniard before the altar in Santa. "'Heard nothing about that, eh? "'Nothing about the silver calabash he spat into?' "'and nothing about losing his leg last voyage, according to the prophecy. "'Didn't you hear a word about them matters and something more, eh? "'No, I don't think you did. How could ye? Who knows it? "'Not all Nantucket, I guess. "'But how's ever, mayhap, you've heard tell about the leg, "'and how he lost it. Ay, you've heard of that, I dare say. "'Oh, yes, that everyone knows a most.' I mean they know he's only one leg, and that a parmist said he took the other off. My friend, said I, what all this gibberish of yours is about, I don't know, and I don't much care, for it seems to me that you must be a little damaged in the head. But if you are speaking of Captain Ahab, of that ship there, the Pequod, then let me tell you that I know all about the loss of his leg. All about it, eh? Sure you do? All? Pretty sure. With finger pointed and eye levelled at the Pequod, the beggar-like stranger stood a moment, as if in troubled reverie, and then, starting a little, turned and said, "'You've shipped, have ye? Names down on the papers? Well, well, what's signed is signed, and what's to be will be, and then again perhaps it won't be, after all. Anyhow, it's all fixed and arranged already, and some sailors or other must go with him, I suppose.' "'As well these as any other men, God pity em. A "'Morning to you, shipmates, morning. "'The ineffable heavens bless ye. "'I'm sorry I stopped ye.' "'Look here, friend,' said I. "'If you have anything important to tell us, out with it. "'But if you are only trying to bamboozle us, "'you're mistaken in your game. "'That's all I have to say. "'And it's said very well. "'And I like to hear a chap talk up that way. "'You are just the man for him, the likes of you.' "'Morning to your shipmates, morning. "'Oh, when you get there, tell em I've concluded not to make one of em. "'Ah, oh, my dear fellow, you can't fool us that way. "'You can't fool us. "'It is the easiest thing in the world for a man to look as if he had a great secret in him. "'Morning to your shipmates, morning.' "'Morning it is,' said I. "'Come along, Queequeg, let's leave this crazy man. "'But stop. Tell me your name, will you?' Elijah. Elijah, thought I, and we walked away, both commenting after each other's fashion upon this ragged old sailor, and agreed that he was nothing but a humbug trying to be a bugbear. But we had not gone perhaps above a hundred yards when chancing to turn a corner and looking back as I did so, who should be seen but Elijah following us, though at a distance, Somehow the sight of him struck me so that I said nothing to Queequeg of his being behind, but passed on with my comrade, anxious to see whether the stranger would turn the same corner that we did. He did, and then it seemed to me that he was dogging us, but with what intent I could not for the life of me imagine. This circumstance, coupled with his ambiguous half-hinting, half-revealing, shrouded sort of talk, now begat in me all kinds of vague wonderments and half-apprehensions, and all connected with the Pequod, and Captain Ahab, and the leg he had lost, and the Cape Horn fit, and the silver calabash, and what Captain Peleg had said of him when I left the ship on the day previous. 
and the prediction of the squaw Tistig, and the voyage we had bound ourselves to sail, and a hundred other shadowy things. I was resolved to satisfy myself whether this ragged Elijah was really dogging us or not, and with that intent crossed the way with Queequeg, and on that side of it retraced our steps. But Elijah passed on without seeming to notice us. This relieved me, and once more and finally, as it seemed to me, I pronounced him, in my heart, a humbug. CHAPTER Twenty, ALL ASTIR A day or two passed, and there was great activity aboard the Pequod. Not only were the old sails being mended, but new sails were coming on board, and bolts of canvas and coils of rigging. In short, everything betokened that the ship's preparations were hurrying to a close. Captain Peleg seldom or never went ashore, but sat in his wigwam, keeping a sharp lookout upon the hands. Bildad did all the purchasing and providing at the stores, and the men employed in the hold and on the rigging were working till long after nightfall. On the day following Queequeg's signing the articles, word was given at all the inns where the ship's company were stopping that their chests must be on board before night, for there was no telling how soon the vessel might be sailing. So Queequeg got down our traps, resolving, however, to sleep ashore till the last. But it seems they always give very long notice in these cases, and the ship did not sail for several days. But no wonder, there was a good deal to be done, and there is no telling how many things to be thought of before the Pequod was fully equipped. Everyone knows what a multitude of things, beds, saucepans, knives and forks, shovels and tongs, napkins, nutcrackers and what not, are indispensable to the business of housekeeping, just so with whaling, which necessitates the three years' housekeeping upon the wide ocean, far from all grocers, costermongers, doctors, bakers, and bankers. And though this also holds true of merchant vessels, yet not by any means to the same extent as with whalemen. For besides the great length of the whaling voyage, the numerous articles peculiar to the prosecution of the fishery, and the impossibility of replacing them at the remote harbors usually frequented, it must be remembered that of all ships, whaling vessels are the most exposed to accidents of all kinds, and especially to the destruction and loss of the very things upon which the success of the voyage most depends. Hence the spare boats, spare spars, and spare lines and harpoons, and spare everythings almost, but a spare captain and duplicate ship. At the period of our arrival at the island, the heaviest storage of the Pequod had been almost completed, comprising her beef, bread, water, fuel, and iron hoops and staves. But as before hinted, for some time there was a continual fetching and carrying on board of diverse odds and ends of things, both large and small. Chief among those who did this fetching and carrying was Captain Bildad's sister, a lean old lady of a most determined and indefatigable spirit, but withal very kind-hearted, who seemed resolved that if she could help it, nothing should be found wanting in the Pequod, after once fairly getting to sea. At one time she would come on board with a jar of pickles for the steward's pantry, another time with a bunch of quills for the chief mate's desk, where he kept his log, a third time with a roll of flannel for the small of someone's rheumatic back. Never did any woman better deserve her name, which was Charity, Aunt Charity, as every one called her. And like a sister of Charity did this charitable Aunt Charity bustle about, hither and thither, ready to turn her hand and heart to anything that promised to yield safety, comfort, and consolation to all on board a ship in which her beloved brother Bildad was concerned, and in which she herself owned a score or two of well-saved dollars. But it was startling to see this excellent-hearted Quakeress coming on board, as she did the last day, with a long oil ladle in one hand and a still longer whaling lance in the other. Nor was Bildad himself nor Captain Peleg at all backward. As for Bildad, he carried about with him a long list of the articles needed, and at every fresh arrival down went his mark opposite that article upon the paper. Every once in a while Peleg came hobbling out of his whalebone den, roaring at the men down the hatchways, roaring up to the riggers at the masthead, and then concluding by roaring back into his wigwam. During these days of preparation Queequeg and I often visited the craft, 
and as often I asked about Captain Ahab, and how he was, and when he was going to come on board his ship. To these questions they would answer that he was getting better and better, and was expected aboard every day. Meantime the two captains, Peleg and Bildad, could attend to everything necessary to fit the vessel for the voyage. If I had been downright honest with myself, I would have seen very plainly in my heart that I did but half fancy being committed this way to so long a voyage, without once laying my eyes on the man who was to be the absolute dictator of it, so soon as the ship sailed out upon the open sea. But when a man suspects any wrong, it sometimes happens that if he be already involved in the matter, he insensibly strives to cover up his suspicions even from himself. And much this way it was with me. I said nothing, and tried to think nothing. At last it was given out that some time next day the ship would certainly sail. So next morning Queequeg and I took a very early start. Chapter 21 Going Aboard It was nearly six o'clock, but only grey imperfect misty dawn when we drew nigh the wharf. "'There are some sailors running ahead there, if I see right,' said I to Queequeg. "'It can't be shadows. She's off by sunrise, I guess. Come on.' "'Avast!' cried a voice, whose owner, at the same time coming close behind us, laid a hand upon both our shoulders, and then, insinuating himself between us, stood stooping forward a little, in the uncertain twilight, strangely peering from Queequeg to me. It was Elijah. "'Going aboard?' "'Hands off, will you?' said I. "'Looky here,' said Queequeg, shaking himself. "'Go away!' "'Ain't going aboard, then?' "'Yes, we are,' said I. "'But what business is that of yours? "'Do you know, Mr. Elijah, that I consider you a little impertinent?' "'No, no, no, I wasn't aware of that,' said Elijah, "'slowly and wonderingly looking from me to Queequeg "'with the most unaccountable glances. "'Elijah,' said I, you will oblige my friend and me by withdrawing. We are going to the Indian and Pacific Oceans, and would prefer not to be detained. Ye be, be ye, coming back before breakfast? He's cracked, Queequeg, said I. Come on. Hello, cried stationary Elijah, hailing us when we had removed a few paces. Never mind him, said I. Queequeg, come on. But he stole up to us again, and suddenly clapping his hands on my shoulder, said, did you see anything looking like men going towards that ship a while ago? Struck by this plain, matter-of-fact question, I answered, saying, Yes, I thought I did see four or five men, but it was too dim to be sure. Very dim, very dim, said Elijah. Morning to ye. Once more we quitted him, but once more he came softly after us, and touching my shoulder again, said, See if you can find em now, will ye? Find who? Morning to ye, morning to ye, he rejoined, again moving off. Oh, I was going to warn you against... But never mind, never mind. It's all one, all in the family, too. Sharp frost this morning, ain't it? Good-bye to ye. Shan't see you again very soon, I guess, unless it's before the grand jury. And with these cracked words he finally departed, leaving me for the moment in no small wonderment at his frantic impudence. At last, stepping on board the Pequod, we found everything in profound quiet, not a soul moving. The cabin entrance was locked within, the hatches were all on, and lumbered with coils of rigging. Going forward to the forecastle, we found the slide of the scuttle open. Seeing a light, we went down, and found only an old rigger there, wrapped in a tattered pea-jacket. He was thrown at whole length upon two chests, his face downwards and enclosed in his folded arms. The profoundest slumber slept upon him. "'Those sailors we saw, Queequeg, where can they have gone to?' said I, looking dubiously at the sleeper. But it seemed that, when on the wharf, Queequeg had not at all noticed what I now alluded to. Hence I would have thought myself to have been optically deceived in that matter were it not for Elijah's otherwise inexplicable question." But I beat the thing down, and again marking the sleeper, jocularly hinted to Queequeg that perhaps we had best sit up with the body, telling him to establish himself accordingly. He put his hand upon the sleeper's rear, as though feeling if it was soft enough, and then, without more ado, quietly sat down there. "'Gracious, Queequeg, don't sit there,' said I. 
Oh, Perry dood seat, said Queequeg. My country way. Won't hurt him face. Face, said I. Call that his face? A very benevolent countenance, then. But how hard he breathes. He's heaving himself. Get off, Queequeg. You're heavy. It's grinding the face of the poor. Get off, Queequeg. Look, he'll twitch you off soon. I wonder he don't wake. Queequeg removed himself to just beyond the head of the sleeper, and lighted his tomahawk pipe. I sat at the feet. We kept the pipe passing over the sleeper, and from one to the other. Meanwhile, upon questioning him in his broken fashion, Queequeg gave me to understand that in his land, owing to the absence of settees and sofas of all sorts, the kings, chiefs, and great people generally were in the custom of fattening some of the lower orders for Ottomans, and to furnish a house comfortably in that respect you had only to buy up eight or ten lazy fellows and lay them round in the piers and alcoves. Besides, it was very convenient on an excursion, much better than those garden chairs which are convertible into walking sticks. Upon occasion a chief calling his attendant and desiring him to make a settee of himself under a spreading tea, perhaps in some damp marshy place. While narrating these things, every time Queequeg received the tomahawk from me, he flourished the hatchet side of it over the sleeper's head. "'What's that for, Queequeg?' "'Perry easy, Killy. Oh, perry easy.' He was going on with some wild reminiscences about his tomahawk pipe, which, it seemed, had in its two uses both brained his foes and soothed his soul, when we were directly attracted to the sleeping rigor. The strong vapor was now completely filling the contracted hole. It began to tell upon him. He breathed with a sort of muffledness, then seemed troubled in the nose, then revolved over once or twice, then sat up and rubbed his eyes. Hello, he breathed at last. Who be ye smokers? Shipped men, answered I. When does she sail? Ay, ay, you're going in her, be ye? She sails today. The captain came aboard last night. What captain? Ahab? Who but him indeed? I was going to ask him some further questions concerning Ahab when we heard a noise on deck. Hello, Starbucks astir, said the rigger. He's a lively chief mate, that. Good man and a pious, but all alive now. I must turn too. And so saying, he went on deck, and we followed. It was now clear sunrise. Soon the crew came on board in twos and threes, the riggers bestirred themselves, the mates were actively engaged, and several of the shore people were busy in bringing various last things on board. Meanwhile, Captain Ahab remained invisibly enshrined within his cabin. End of chapter 17 to 21